Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome, everyone. Still here? We are all still here. I uh, hope you still enjoyed topology. So let me kind of wrap up what we have seen up to this point and kind of the game I was playing. Um, hopefully, because we're kind of jumping to a slightly different topic. Not, not, not really, we'll stay with services, but it kind of will change a little bit gear. Um, so it's good to recall, right? So what, what we have done is we have played the following game. Um, let me pull up a picture. Maybe this one. Yeah. So all of these are spheres. And everything you see here is a polygon decomposition of a sphere. So what we actually did is uh, one with many faces. Um, so what we did is the following kind of game. Um, we had a surface like a sphere. And we have a polygon decomposition of it. And this is really a kind of a good picture of a polygon decomposition. So all of these little triangles are the little polygons we could draw, we would usually draw uh, on the plane, right? So, um, and the idea is we kind of take it apart, make it a two-dimensional picture, and then we have this little jigsaw puzzle where we have many pieces, and we are kind of trying to figure out how they uh, kind of form a, a surface together and whether we can just read off from the pieces what kind of surface we see. Okay, and so most of the time we just had one face, um, but it was not necessary. We can have many, many faces, like in, like in the picture. So it's really like a large jigsaw puzzle. Uh, so you have all of them. And you should now think of them. They're all like in, in, they're all on my slides. They're all uh, in, arranged in, in kind of a grid or something. And I would ask the question, or we all should ask the question: What is the, what is actually the surface we see? There will be gluing rules because we want to get those pictures eventually. Okay. And then we identified. Um, a method, it's really wonderful, to just read off from the polygon decomposition, from the huge jigsaw puzzle with all of these little pieces, how to reobtain the, the two-dimensional object, actually, right? So the, the real surface in a, in a unique way. And this was the standard form. Okay, and this is kind of really amazing. And we want to push this a little bit further as we go along, uh, in particular today, after we, we start with some, well, some observations from, from one of the previous talks uh, that we'll just leave up a little bit. But eventually, we come to this picture. And as you can already kind of tell from those pictures, we want to draw something on the surface that kind of gives us a polygon decomposition. And then we want to take it again and study it uh, in a planar way. All right, so here are more polygon decompositions. I just pulled them up because it's always a bit confusing. Because most of the time, we are staring at one face. But actually, what you really should think of is like a large jigsaw puzzle with like many, many, many tiny pieces. And you've cut uh, the big example into much smaller bits. So this is, a guy, again, the resolution is a bit bad. But anyway, this is, again, one of those polygon decompositions with like a, a trillion triangles. And they're now all lying next to one another. And you are, we are supposed to identify the surface, which a priori looks like this is completely impossible. But we have an algorithm to do so, and it's kind of uh, really amazing, right? And you can have very, very different polygon decompositions. So those are the most famous ones. All of these are polygon decompositions of the sphere. They are called the platonic solids. Uh, the cube is probably the most famous one. It's just a six-sided dice, where every polygon is just a just a square. So it's a fun exercise to take it apart and draw the six sides just one next to one another, and then put the edges and try to identify. Uh, the corresponding sphere. Okay, but this is what we did. And we kind of want to do something similar, kind of want to push that further because we had this really amazing theorem that kind of classifies polygon decompositions of all possible uh, surfaces. Okay, and that's what we are aiming up. Um, so like today and probably tomorrow as well. Okay, but Okay, let's take a step back before we go there. Like we will go there in like 20 minutes. Um, remember that we had this one. So we had to for, for uh, graphs, we had this vertex degree equation, the handshake lemma, where the sum of the degrees is twice the number of edges. And I show you something similar for surfaces, which is kind of really remarkable. Um, okay, and how did that work? Well, essentially every edge. Uh, if you if you shake my hand, I shake yours. Every edge contributes uh, two, for two vertices, so this equation 
eventually will hold. Okay, so that was essentially the argument, right? And we kind of, maybe one could hope, and turned out to be true, that there's some similar formula for uh, our polygon friends, so our, our surfaces. And we want to do this, and note the difference here, right? The graph is just vertices and edges. A surface has faces as well. So we want some equation that kind of mixes them all together and gives us some relation between vertices, edges, and faces. Um, and what we need to do in order to, to get nice formulas, we kind of need to make sure we, we know what the degree is, right? The degree here is kind of the key ingredient uh, but what does it actually mean for a surface where everything is kind of identified? So, um, yeah, so let's have a look what that actually could mean. And spoiler, the formula will look essentially exactly the same, which is kind of really beautiful. And then I try to explain why that is actually the case. So the, the problem we are facing immediately is that if you look on the polygon decomposition of a surface, there will be identified edges. That's the whole point of the game, right? You glue along those edges. So how, how should we count? How should we count them twice? Should we count them once? Right. So we kind of need to kind of decide what we want to do. And it turns out that we don't need to, um, as we will see now. So let's just do it. So let's, let's say you, you want to define what that is to have the correct formula. What you would look at is first an example. So let's, let's just look at an example. So here's some surface. Okay. Doesn't matter what it is now but we want to have some form of a, a vertex edge face type of degree counting equation. So let's try. Okay, so first thing you would do is you would label the vertices. Uh, sorry, the, the, the vertices, yes. In this case, we have two, x and y. Okay, fine. And now we want to, we have two vertices and we have four edges. Okay. So hopefully the degree of the vertices will add up to Eight, because that's two times four. So let's see. So um, the count we do is this one. We identify the vertices and the edges along the gluing. So they are really just two vertices and four edges. And what is the degree? Okay, so let me just do it. So here's the answer. Let's just do it. I, I write a vertex x here. I write the vertex y here. And now let's see what's going on. A is a loop on x. Uh, C is here, C is here, A is here. C is a loop on Y. And D is also a loop on X, so let's put a D here as well. This was supposed to be an A. This is a D. D is a loop on X as well, and so D is also done. And our little friend B goes from Y to X, right? So B goes from Y to X, so B goes from here to here. Good. So this is B. If we now count the degree, we get five. Huh? So two loops is four, plus one edge B is five, and three on the other side. Good. So five and three, that's our number eight. That's what we wanted because we have four edges, A, B, C, and D. So it actually works out. Okay? So in this example, it works out. turns out it works out uh, in general, and that's, that's a count we are supposed to do, right? So we, had, we, we identify the edges and the vertices, and actually what we count is a picture below. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. I just put x and y, and I just connect them along whatever they do uh, in the polygon itself, and I just count. Five plus three is eight, which is twice the number of edges because we have four edges. And for the edges, we count labels, right? So A, B, C, D in this case. Awesome. Um, we could also do that without identifying edges, but that turns out to be the wrong game. So without identifying edges, I see six edges, and I see six vertices, right? Without identifying edges or vertices, I see six and six. Every vertex has degree two, but that's somehow the wrong count, because that's kind of not taking into account that we're looking at a polygon. It's just really looking at the graph. So we always do um, this count. This is the correct one. Don't be confused, because both give the correct answer. Uh, but we, we want actually this count because this really takes into account what a polygon actually is, right? what the polygon decomposition is. Okay, fine. And it turns out that our vertex degree gradient is still true with this counting. It's kind of nice, right? 
Because that's not clear at all. We identify edges and we identify vertices. So why should the formula stay true? Um, but it turns out that the same count actually uh, works. It's really the same. Every edge contributes plus two and every vertex contributes one. And why, is it, why does it work? Well, because we are really looking at this graph and not which is the identified polygon and not at the polygon itself. And there it's just a graph and we can just um, do the same count as we did before. I hope that makes some sense. So magic here is um, the, the, same, the same formula, literally the same formula still works for polygons, uh, polygon decomposition of surfaces. Okay, at this stage you should complain because really a, a surface is something two-dimensional and I'm not talking about faces at all. So somehow this is not the right equation in some sense. Okay, it holds, fine, very good. But where are our faces, right? So looks a bit, looks a bit like the wrong counting. We have two-dimensional objects, but we completely ignore the faces. Oh, but there's a fix, and it's actually a really cute fix. And we'll see that several times. It's, it's kind of nice, because it's the same equation will hold for the faces by a certain type of duality that I'm going to uh, explain in a second. Okay, fine. So let me define the degree of a face. We want the same equation, but now faces equal something. Um, so the degree of the face is just whatever type of polygon it is. If it's an n-gon, you count. If it's a seven-gon, you count seven. If it's a triangle, you count three. So it's the number of edges. Okay, so if this is my polygon, one, two, uh, my face, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So the degree of F is thirteen. Okay, very good. The degree of F is thirteen. That's really easy to count. Just whatever type of polygon you have, the number of edges of the polygon is what you're looking for. Well, so the degree of F is just if it's an n gun, the degree of F is just n. And in this case, I can just count it. Uh, 30. Okay. Faces are never identified, so we somehow never need to care about that. So in the polygon decomposition, we identify vertices and edges, but never faces. Faces stay what they are. Yeah? You never want to glue faces together. That would, would kind of leave the class of surfaces. So we never do that. So actually, this is the correct count already. So that's what I'm claiming. Okay. So for a face, the degree is really easy. Just count the number of edges. If it's an n gun, your degree is n. Remarkably easy type of counting. And is there still a relation between those two? Huh? It's kind of a question. And by a miracle, by a really absolutely fantastic miracle that I'm going to kind of explain in a second, it, it still holds. It's just, um, anyway, let's, let's give, do an example before I state the theorem. Okay, so. Our little sphere here um, has a face, and it has two edges, and the face is a foreground. So uh, the degree of the face is a four, right? So for all of them, it's four, and number of edges. So maybe I do this one in uh, green, and the number of edges in red. So the number of edges is two, and two times two is four. So that works out really well. Okay. Very good. Number of edges is two. Let me just do it. Two, two. Okay. And it's always a it's always a foregone. So all of these kind of work out very nicely. Let me just do it in black. Why not? All of these are kind of nice. Very good. Okay. So seems like our little formula holds. We tested it for the, our favorite surfaces. Um, almost, there are a few more favorite surfaces. So let's do it for them. Uh, so here, it's still a foreground, but I see now four edges, which makes my equation going wrong. Okay, not very good, or bad, depends, uh, we'll see. Uh, so this has four again, this has four again, and in this case, you have two, so actually this works, uh, uh, sorry, you have three, I'm, I'm discounting ABC three, and you have ABC three, so again, 
this doesn't work. Okay. So it works for four out of seven in this case. And maybe we can actually spot for those where it works exactly those without boundary. And that's the theorem. So for the ones without boundary, the one with the checker mark, with the check mark here, those guys. So for, for them, it, it does work. So for them, the equation is correct. And this is exactly the statement. And you can't do better. As you can see, as soon as you have boundary, the equation goes wrong. Yeah? So you can't do better. So let's just exclude them. That's just a fact of life. Let's not worry about it too much. Um, and here we go, the phase degree equation, right? the vertex degree equation, the phase degree equation, looks exactly the same under this condition, so close just means no boundary. So that's the term in the jargon for no boundary. Otherwise, we have the phase degree equation, which <laughs> kind of by a miracle looks exactly the same as the vertex degree equation. Right? Um, you will see in a second why this is actually, why this holds. Of course, you can do a combinatorial argument, and I list it here on the slide, um, so if you want to have a look. But there's actually a better argument, so um, we'll do that argument in a second. But remarkably, it's the same theorem, right? It's like vertex phase works exactly the same. You always count um, twice the number of edges. We only have this restriction of having no boundary. Um, you will see also in my kind of proof sketch why this is supposed to be true and you really can't do any better. So this is just what it is. Fact of life, we can't do any better, but it's, it's still kind of a miracle. Um, that's the same formula from the graphs, just holds kind of spot on for um, the surfaces. That must be, there must be something going on. So whenever you see something like this, then there must be something going on. Right? So it's usually in mathematics there are no coincidences. Um, and it's, it's mostly a matter of question whether we can identify why something is happening. Okay, so there is a combinatorial argument that I just wrote down here, but that's kind of the wrong way of proving it. Okay, because this argument will not tell us why this is supposed to be true. I will give you a better argument in a sec. So anyway, so um, here's a combinatorial argument. If you want to read it on the slides, it's fine, but I have a better argument for you in a second. Okay, and I, I say it again, why this argument I'm going to show you is somewhat better, because it, somewhat, it explains why it is supposed to be true, instead of just writing down the counting. Right? So, okay, each face contributes x, and each edge contributes y, and then you just sum everything together. Yeah, fine, but kind of having a good um, idea why something is true is somewhat way more important than, okay, counting something here and counting something there. Okay, and the idea is the idea of duals. So kind of very often in, in, in life, maybe even, or in mathematics, there's something like a dual. Like, think of a coin. A coin has two sides, and they're kind of related in a very easy way. And they're kind of the same, although they're different. And something like this happens in mathematics, like, all the time, and in physics and whatever. It's kind of really more like the type of fact of life, that you have some duality. You have some twin of something. Yeah? Um, and we have it here as well. So that the reason why our two formulas, vertex and phase, look the same is because they are twins under a certain operation. And that's kind of a way better way of, of seeing that this is supposed to be true. And I'm going to explain this beautiful operation uh, now. So we take always those, our friend here, uh, V, E, and F. And yeah, so we have some polygon decomposition, and I will now explain what the, what the twin is of the polygon decomposition. And the best way of doing this is to go to an example. Okay, so I've written down uh, how it works formally, but this is how it goes. I have something, so let's say this lives on the disk, so this is what, I, what you see, or on a sphere, let's say, on a sphere. Okay, so what you see is a polygon decomposition of a sphere, just a slightly strange one, because it just looks like a graph, but anyway. Um, we'll go to there in a second. So that it has faces, uh, so here's the face. Uh, let me draw it again, not ruining the picture. So here's my little, not quite bluish looking uh, graph. Let me make it blue. Okay. So it has faces. So let me mark the faces for you. So here's the face, here's the face, here's the face, and here's the face. It has edges. Let me not mark the edges. The edges are hopefully fairly clear. And it has vertices sitting somewhere. Okay. And what we do now is kind of an absolutely amazing operation 
we just mark every face, and let me do it similarly to the picture. So we mark every face with a little, uh, with a little well, marker. Okay. So this will be the new vertices of our dual decomposition. The faces will turn to vertices, like in the degree equation, right? The vertices and then face degree equation. So we turn faces to vertices, and we connect them along. Uh, so th these two are connected so over an edge, so we do this. They're connected over an edge. They're connected over an edge. They're connected over an edge. Uh, these guys are connected over an edge, over an edge. And here's the last one, connected over an edge. And what you see now is this black one. And note the following fun thing happened here. The faces of the blue one, maybe I should put the, yeah. well, the black one is red on the right-hand side. I gotta have used the wrong color. But anyway, the faces of the blue one yeah, are the vertices of the red one. Um, and the vertices of the red, uh, sorry, the faces of the red one correspond to the vertices of the blue one. So they exactly exchange roles, and the edges do the following. So for every edge in the blue one, there's kind of an edge passing in the opposite direction on uh, the red one. So we pair, it's kind of a nice pairing. We have our zero-dimensional objects here. We pair them with faces. And well, this is kind of the fixed point. We pair it with itself. So there's this kind of standard operation in mathematics, it's kind of fun. It's called Poincaré duality. So what I'm showing, we're going to show you is this, this Poincaré duality, where you just list everything in dimension order, and you swap the, to the biggest with the smallest, the next one with the next biggest, the next one with the next biggest. And here we just have three of them, and this is exactly what we did. Okay? So faces become vertices, vertices become faces, and edges kind of go to parallel edges or uh, orthogonal edges, actually. Let's do another example. This is really amazing that this actually works out really nicely. Let's do another one. Yes? Could you quickly explain again where the bottom? Bottom. Oh. Um, there's an outside face. You, uh, we need to count the outside face as well. Face. There's always an outside face. Yes, that's very confusing. There's always an outside face. Okay. I'll take your word. Yes. <laughs> well, what can, by definition, there's an outside face. There you go. Thank you so much. OK. Yeah, this is really confusing. So whenever we draw those pictures, there is always an outside face, OK? And we'll see in a second why I want there to be an outside face. So let's do another one. Here's a polygon decomposition of a sphere. Uh, it's called the cube. So what do we do? We draw one vertex for each face. So we have six vertices arranged um, in this type of crystal type of structure. Right? Every vertex is a face. And we connect, over, we connect um, vertices by an edge if the original faces were neighboring. Okay. And if you do this, we get actually this picture. So the dual of a cube is the noctahedron. Yeah, let's do it again. So we first take the cube. Every vertex, every face gets a vertex. Bash, every face gets a vertex. And then you connect across, uh, across neighboring faces. So for example, um, this guy and this guy are neighbors, so they get an edge. Those two guys uh, on the back our neighbors as well. Here along the back again, they are neighbors. And here in the front again, uh, and then you can connect to the bottom, you can connect to the top. And if you draw in all vertices, which I have done here, all, all edges, which I have done here, you end up exactly with this picture. You have this thing in the middle, which just goes all the way around the, um, the cube. And the top one also has four neighboring faces, and the bottom one also has four neighboring faces. If you just take it. Uh, a dice in your hand, it's kind, of, it's kind of clear that the bottom face has four neighbors. It's just not neighboring the top face. And this is exactly what you see here. Every face has uh, four neighbors. So the graph that you get is an octahedron. So the dual of the cube is the octahedron. OK, so and if you look at the tables of um, kind of number of vertices, number of edges, and number of faces of cubes and octahedrons, you will see that exactly 
uh, the number of faces and the number of vertices will swap, and the number of edges is actually the same. So fun fact, the number of edges of the octahedron is the same as the number of edges of the cube. And you can see it in this operation, because we, the, ed the edges just go to, parallel to, to, to orthogonal edges. So you never change the count of the number of edges. Cool. OK. And this actually explains our, so dual here is always indicated by star. So star is my notation for dual. And this explains why we have the phase degree, vertex degree equation and the phase degree equation exactly as they are. Uh -huh. um, kind of fun. So taking the dual of the vertices swaps vertices and faces. Yeah. And it exactly behaves nicely with respect to the degree. So if uh, we have a, a vertex in, in our original thing, corresponds to a face, so that gives the same name in uh, the, the dual, the dual is the one with the star, so the degrees are uh, the same. But now the, the little v actually on the right hand side is a face. I hope that's not too confusing. So the vertex degree equation for a polygon is the same as the face degree equation for its dual. And of course, the vertex degree equation for the dual uh, is the same as the uh, face degree equation for the original polygon. So they are the, they are exactly matched under this operation: vertex degree and uh, face degree equations. So there's no wonder that they hold. Um, so let me give you the kind of the classical examples. So Kepler did that in. Uh, the famous, so where Kepler describes uh, the, the mathematics behind the uh, movement of the planets, um, Kepler was a little bit obsessed with platonic solids. So, so not everything Kepler said actually was true. He was a little bit too obsessed with platonic solids. But anyway, uh, so Kepler did exactly this duality in this famous um, type of book, Harmoni, Harmonicis Mundi. Um, and here's our example of the cube. So Kepler draws it a little bit nicer than I did, actually. It was pretty impressive. So let me let me try a different color. So what works good on brown, I guess, blue. Yeah, blue works quite well on brown. And the dual, Kepler also tells us what the dual of the tetrahedron is. So the tetrahedron, the dual of the tetrahedron is the tetrahedron. It's very cool. And the dual of the uh, of the bigger ones, so they're, they're dual to one another. So the isocahedron, the 20-sided one, is dual to the 12-sided one, the dodecahedron. So whenever you have those, it's kind of fun. So when you look at the tables and you have some problems in counting vertices or edges or something, you can always go to the dual and kind of change the question from counting one to the other. So for example, the number of faces of um, a, a dodecahedron is really simple because it's by definition, the 12 gun, yeah? so that's 12 faces. Turns out that that's the number of vertices of an isocahedron, because it's kind of the, the, the dual object. And the number of faces of an isocahedron is 20, because it's a 20 sided dice. So that's the number of vertices of the dodecahedron. It's kind of a fun, kind of a fun game. Um, and they have the same number of edges. There you go. Tetrahedron is kind of special, it's kind of self dual. I hope that makes some sense. So if you look at this picture here, you can kind of see that Kepler did the same. There are the, the faces, and in every face you put a vertex, and then you connect across uh, neighboring uh, faces. Yeah. And this is kind of a much better way of kind of explaining uh, our little vertex degree equation and the face degree equation, because they're really just the same under, under this Kepler type duality. And you can defined for um, every surface. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the better way, I said again, the better way of proving that, right? Instead of writing down, okay, this contributes whatever, and this contributes whatever. I just told you an operation, a much richer structure, on surfaces itself, which just turns one equation automatically into the other, without any any work, any counting work at all. It's kind of really nice. And you can somehow always save some countings. As I said here, like the 12 sided dice it clearly has 12 faces. So then the isocahedron, which is a dual, must have 12 vertices. Yeah. 
instead of just counting them, you could just, you could just play this trick. It's kind of really beautiful. Okay, I hope that's clear. Let me come back to the question, why do I want an outside phase? Um, and I will explain that now. So we'll come back to this duality a little bit later. It's kind of really, really fantastic and really powerful. So we don't, uh, hope you will like it as well. Um, okay, the, the real topic that I wanted to address today and kind of in the next few lectures is that we can actually now think of, we have polygons representing surfaces, but a polygon in the end is nothing else than a graph with some faces filled in. So we could think of just drawing graphs on, on surfaces. And we go back to the, kind of the very first week where we looked at graphs and we were all kind of drawing them in the plane, but who tells us to draw them in the plane? We could draw them wherever we want, right? In particular, we could draw them on a torus or whatever, right? And that's what we are going to do. So we're kind of merging now um, kind of the first part of the lecture and now the second part of the lecture. So if you like both, if you dislike both, then you might like whatever comes out, who knows? But uh, kind of the point is, uh, we kind of both are very beautiful and we have kind of non-trivial statements, so why not try to do this one together and there will be a really beautiful theory uh, associated to it. Okay, and re recall that the graph was planar if you can draw it in R2 without edges crossing. And that's how we started. We started drawing in the plane because, well, honestly, my slide is just a plane, right? So it's kind of easiest for me to just draw it in the plane. Similar for you if you draw on your iPad or whatever, um, it's just much easier to do it in the plane. But nobody tells us a priori to just do it in the plane. We could do it on a torus. And that's what we're going to do now. Okay. And all that is happening here is the following. I just pull it up, we go through it, and then I draw an example for you. I don't have an example right I draw an example for you. Or I could pull up an example in a second. But what I'm going to do is the following. Okay. So a planar graph is something that embeds in the kind of easiest surface you can imagine, the plane. Fine. And now we want the same notion for um, any surface. So what we take is a surface and a planar graph in that surface, which we call an embedding of G. So that's here's the terminology, the embedding of G in S. So if S is R2, then it's planar, but now we can do, have any S. It's just a pair of maps that sets the vertices somewhere and sets the edges somewhere such that the edges don't cross. Yeah, so that's all that is written there. Not that exciting. Um, let me actually have a look. I have a picture somewhere. Where do I have a picture? Okay, very good. So here's a graph on a torus, and we can just draw it on the torus, on the polygon of the torus, and then it lives on the torus. And all I'm saying is, I can draw it on a polygon for a torus without inter intersecting edges. So the graph is like this uh, little picture in the background. I will draw one for you in a second. A few more pictures. Okay, so let's make some space. So all I'm saying is that I have one of our surfaces. Here's one. And all I'm saying is I have two maps that send my vertices somewhere, okay? Let's say um, I have a vertex here, I have a vertex here, whatever, I have a vertex here, I have a vertex here. And they set our edges somewhere, whatever, something like this, and I think maybe it goes around, flop, and goes like this, and goes like this, and goes like this, whatever, so that they don't intersect. It's kind of the same notion as a planar graph, but now we are allowed to do this funny operation like going around the handle of the torus. Yeah. And this is kind of an interesting operation because um, let me draw in another edge. I could have now an edge that goes like here and they still don't cross because one of them, the red one, is in front and the blue one goes around in the back. And that's what I call an embedding of a graph onto a surface. Yeah. So we want to study graphs on surfaces. Um, here's an example of an embedding of a graph on a surface. Uh, we could do the following, for example, here if we have another loop, and, but you can also loop around like this, loop around in the back, come out here again, 
So it's kind of an interesting question what kind of graphs you can draw on the surface. Okay? So on torus, you kind of can do different operations than in the plane. And all the fun stuff that is written here is just to make it formal. And the only really message here is my little picture that I've drawn. I hope that makes some sense. We just draw a graph on a vertex. Uh, oh, 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 draw a graph on a vertex, yeah, sure. Draw a graph on a surface without intersecting edges, and I call that an embedding of the graph into the surface. With planar being the case where S is R2. Okay. And what I'm thinking of, if I have this picture, let's go back to it. That's why I did it here. So this picture, I, I thought of it as an embedding of the blue graph onto S2. Yeah? I can draw it on S2. So S2 is a, is a sphere, which I can indicate like this. And I just draw it in front of you. So it's just facing directly towards you. And that's why I have an outside face, because it's kind of the remaining part of the, of the sphere. So a planar graph, all I said is a planar graph is like a graph embedded on a sphere. Okay, and here's the formal theorem. They're all the same. So a graph is planar, and the following are equivalent. I embed it in, like we did, on the plane, our little plane in the background. I put it on a disk, or I put it in the sphere. And the sphere picture is exactly justifying why I want this outside face because it's kind of the remaining part of the sphere. There's still, there's still uh, uh, an area there that takes this area on the remaining part of the sphere. And how do we do this? Okay, so I claim this is actually really simple, so let's, let's try. Okay, so let's do first this step. So if I have a graph somewhere on the plane, well, here's my graph. Um, do I have an example of a nice graph? No. Just draw any graph. Here's a graph. Very good. And it's in the plane. So how do I get it on the disk? Well, it's finite, so I draw some, some radius around it and just cut the picture off at that point, and now it's living on a disk. Yeah? So it, it's filled in here. And now it's living on a disk. Huh? Whether it lives on a disk or whether it lives in R3, R2, that's actually the same. Right? I just it's just fine, I just draw a little circle around it and that's your disk. Um, the other way around, from here to here, is, well, you have a circle, just ignores the circle. Yeah, and then, then it lives in uh, the plane. Right, so we're really generalizing the notion of a planar graph that we had before. Okay, and the most interesting one is, so one and two are kind of the same. It, it's just, just a difference whether you want to draw them in a, in a circle or not, whether you want to ignore the circle or not. Okay, and the, the final one is a bit funnier, but you all, to, you all know the answer to this one, actually. So let me just pull it up again. So how can you see that those are equivalent? Disk or whatever, the, the, two, the first two are equivalent anyway. So let's say um, from... Well, let's do it actually this way to make it a bit clearer. I want to go from here to here and back to here. Okay. From between R2 and S2. Okay. But I already told you how to go between R2 and S2. Um, it's this picture. So it's a stereographical projection. So if I have a graph, you can see it because my little uh, illustration here is a graph, right, if you want. If I have a graph on a sphere, then I can just project it down to the plane and I get a graph in the plane. And this operation is reversible. I can just take the graph in the plane and I pull it up to the sphere. All I need to kind of do is I need to move uh, G away from the North Pole. But it's a finite graph, so I just move it away from the North Pole and project it down uh, to the plane. And why is this awesome? Well, this is awesome because I want to sell this idea of studying uh, graphs on surfaces, and what we have seen already is kind of the, the one special case of kind of the easiest possible surface, the sphere. Yeah. It's really the same under this map. I said again, you can think of this little um, kind of little ball made out of plastic as being a graph, just with very thick edges, if you want. And there's your graph on the bottom. It's just a projection under the under the light source at the North Pole. 
And if you have a graph at the bottom, you can just follow the rays backwards and just pull it up to uh, a graph on, on the sphere. I, uh, the goal for the next like three or four lectures is to study graphs on surfaces. And the planar ones are the ones that we already know. And there's a special case of where our surface is actually S2. And now we want to have a torus, or if we're really sophisticated, we want to do it on a projective plane or something, right? In principle, we can do it on, on any type of surface. Hope that makes some sense. We're kind of combining now well, the first week and the second week of the lecture into one. We just study now graphs on surfaces. And it makes sense to do it now, because we, ha we have classified all surfaces, so we know how they look like. And now we kind of want to look at how to put graphs uh, on surfaces. Hope that makes some sense. Okay. Let me just explain that very quickly, and then I pull up one of my favorite theorems. Uh, well, maybe that has to wait for next time, but we'll see. All right. So um, to answer to answer yet again the, the, the very excellent question about the faces, so the faces are always the connected components of surface without graph. Yeah? So if I go back to the original picture where the question came up, where is my too many slides? Here's my picture. I think of it, the, the blue one, I think of it as being on the sphere. So the faces are exactly where the red dots are because they're connected components. If I take out the graph, Whatever remains has connected components, and I call them faces. Okay. So the outside one is a connected component, and that's why the outside one will always appear in this picture. So never, please never forget the outside one. It's always a bit confusing, but there's always the outside one. Too many slides. Good. All right. A little bit of an easier example, if we see it in the disk. So where's my disk? Well, my screen is my disk, right? So I can just draw a little disk around. So what are the faces of K4? K4, remember, was a complete graph on four vertices. Um, well, I can count four of them. Yeah? So let me mark them. And it's kind of remarkable. It doesn't depend on the embedding. You always count four. It's not quite obvious, but let's do it. So here, 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 and the outside one is four. Here, 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 and here is four. Hope that makes some sense. And it's really just put them, bleh. the coloring could have been better here, I guess. Um, put them on, on a disk, take out the graph, so that's why it's supposed to be white. Maybe I should have made the disk a little bit darker. But take out the graph and count the, the components you see, the colored components you see. And this is a, those are your faces. Again, that's why I have uh, my outside one. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, so if the shading would be better, it would be a bit easier to see, I guess. Um, it looks quite okay on the slides, I apologize. Um, okay, hope this is clear, right? Just take them out and count the number of connected components in, in, the, dual, in, in, uh, in the surface. Okay, turns out it doesn't depend on the embedding, which is kind of remarkable. But right now, that's not, that's not so clear. We'll see that eh, probably not today anymore. Okay. Okay. So that be a graph without leaves. So the leaves are kind of a little bit strange because they kind of don't correspond to anything nice in a um, in one of our polygon decompositions. So it's a bit more general to put graphs on um, on a surface. But let's say it's a planar graph. Then you could think of a planar graph as a polygon decomposition of S2. In case you're wondering where are all, are all of our polygon decompositions, any planar graph gives you one. There you go, there, there, there are a lot of them. And the polygons correspond exactly to the non-trivial cycles in the graph. Okay, I have a formal proof, but let's rather look at the, at the example. Okay. So if I draw this not on a disk, but I think of this as being drawn on a sphere, yeah? So then I have my little polygons here. I have a little polygon of this type. This is this one here. I have a red one here. I have a blue one down here. It's kind of a little bit strange, but anyway. 
And I have the, the outside one, which is also just a polygon. And if you count one, two, three, it's just a, it's just a triangle again. So there's just four triangles glued together. Yeah? It is actually a tetrahedron. It's just a very strange picture of a tetrahedron. There are four triangles glued together such that those three edges go down, go here. So let me illustrate the gluing. So we would identify those two edges. We would identify those guys. We would identify those guys. And uh, let me draw, do it like this. This one goes here. This one goes here. And blue is my final color. This one goes here. And we just take them together. And if you do that yourself, if you would build them out of paper or something, you could actually build them together into um, the sphere. And that works for any planar graph. So you just take, a, take the planar graph, take its faces, these are your little polygons, and the gluing rules are determined by the graph. And you could just put them next to one another as we usually do it in the, in the jigsaw type of picture here. So every planar graph gives the polygon decomposition of a surface, uh, of a S2, which is kind of remarkable because remember that we have classified polygon decompositions essentially. And there, there are a lot of them. Every planar graph gives you one, for example. It's kind of actually really remarkable. Cool. So let me wrap up today by at least telling you the following. Our Euler characteristic. There you go. It's still true. With graphs on surfaces. Uh, in, in this case, a sphere. So we'll see actually that it will be true in general. So this is the Euler characteristic of S2. Yeah, and I just explained to you that planar and S2, they're really related, they're really the same. Um, and for any planar graph, um, do I have an example, otherwise I will draw one. Uh, yeah, I do, but this one is too fancy. For every planar graph, you can do the following trick. So let me draw a planar graph for you. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I can put in a little star, very good. Here's a planar graph. It has a lot of edges and then a lot of vertices and a lot of faces, but still this equation will hold. Um, okay. And why will this equation hold? Well, let's, let's at least count. So this is supposed to be a vertex here, a vertex here, and a vertex here, and so on. So I see six vertices in the middle and six vertices at the outside. So I have 12 vertices. Okay. So how many faces do I have? I have one at the outside, one, two, three, four, five, six, and another one. So the number of faces is eight. And I could count now the number of vertices, or could I be just lazy and just use the formula? Um, so the number of vertices, as uh, the number of edges, if you would count them, should be 18. Okay. Um, so let's try to count 18. So we have two here, and they go all the way around. That's 12, and we have six in the middle. So we have uh, 18 vertices. And it always works for any planar graph. So if you ever run into problems of you want to count the edges of a planar graph, because these are usually tricky to count, just count the other two numbers and use the formula. Our Euler characteristic thing still works. It looks exactly the same as for the sphere. It's kind of very remarkable. Um, so two is the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. Wonderful. And the proof, um, and that's the last thing I do, is essentially, I, mean, I, I do it formally, but it doesn't really matter. Um, if it's a tree, just do it. If it's not a tree, use the previous theorem, which is really, really, the, the tree is kind of a special case. You can somewhat ignore it. If it's not a tree, then it gives a polygon, polygon decomposition of S2, and for polygon decomposition, we know that this holds, so it has to hold as well. Awesome. So, um, and this gives us, and then we'll do this next time, a formal way, for example, of showing that this one is not planar, because it will not satisfy this equation, for example. Anyway, I've showed you um, kind of the, the next part of the lecture is about graphs and surfaces at the same time. And here's already a pretty cool theorem kind of the Euler characteristic uh, argument. The Euler characteristic always works. It's always the Euler characteristic. It's still the same for um, planar graphs if you are careful what you count a face. But you should always need to count 
the outside face as well. Okay, thank you so much for coming, and I hope to see you tomorrow.